where uh, we left off um, last week, namely with the um, annealing. So just to remind you, um, after cold rolling, your material is cold deform. It's very hard. Uh, <coughs> can't really use it um, in most applications, so you need to recrystallize it. Um, when you do the recrystallization, uh, you have two options, you batch annealing, or you can do it via continuous annealing. In the case of uh, batch annealing, you have a very slow process, very slow process. Uh, you can see here that to um, uh, anneal coils that are stacked in the batch annealing furnace, you need about 24 hours and about the same amount of time to, um, to get the cooling. So during this um, recrystallization annealing, so there's no transformation going on, yes, um, you, uh, you basically uh, recrystallize the material, you also develop texture in uh, strip material. And, uh, and this can be very beneficial because you, the, the texture we obtain uh, for um, cold rolled low carbon steels um, as defined by the parameter R, yes, um, is the formability as defined by uh, the parameter R is a very strong function of the amount of 111 uh, fiber orientation you have in the material. In the case, so and, and this is what, how you have to imagine this, you, you have the grains here in, the, um, in, in your sheet material, what you, what you basically want to have is the unit cell in each grain uh, uh, oriented in such a way that the 111 axis points upward. Um, that's the main thing. Um, there are some preferred orientations within this fiber, and for instance, the one shown here, where uh, in addition to having the 111 orientation perpendicular to the sheet, you have the 110 orientation parallel to the rolling direction. All right? Okay, and, and this kind of orientation gives you high R values and low values of the uh, planar anisotropy. Good. Now, the, um, the way you achieve this high texture, um, uh, high volume fraction of favorable texture, um, is in the case of batch annealed strip material due to a very special phenomenon, yes, which um, in which the precipitation of aluminum nitride during the recrystallization has an impact on the texture. So um, in order to understand this, you have to look at uh, the, the temperature as a function of time, yes, and uh, consider the recrystallization start temperature line and the precipitation of aluminum nitride. So when, you, when we, precipitate, we have a precipitate formation, yes, we, uh, it's characterized by kinetics. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So at a temperature below the solubility temperature of aluminum nitride, yes, uh, as a function of time, yes, I will have a certain amount of aluminum nitride uh, precipitated. So I can, for instance, um, look at this as saying, well, the amount of aluminum present as aluminum nitride, okay? So the total uh, amount of aluminum that you, you have will be of the order of three, uh, say, 300 ppm, yes? And if I'm below the solubility temperature, as a function of time, I will form 
aluminum nitride. And it, it may not be uh, this uh, aluminum that's uh, tied up as aluminum nitride. It doesn't need to be um, the entire 300 ppm mm -hmm. okay? as a function of that. And um, so you can also, uh, so you can do this uh, at different temperatures. Yeah? And then you get a temperature versus time diagram, which we call the precipitation uh, uh, temperature time diagram, the PP precipitation, um, excuse me, temperature PTT, precipitation time temperature diagram. And it, it's basically a C curve. Yeah, like this, and uh, the precipitation, of course, can only start as when you're below the solubility temperature. Hmm? Basically tells me that at uh, this temperature here, I have very fast precipitation of uh, aluminum nitride that starts at this moment, yes? And, uh, okay, so um, then there is another curve. That's the curve for the uh, uh, recrystallization. The process of recrystallization has a very simple uh, um, time dependence. Hmm? If I do a recrystallization at high temperature, it doesn't take long for the recrystallization to start. Yes. If I do the recrystallization at lower temperature, the recrystallization is more sluggish. So typically, a recrystallization start curve, recrystallization start curve looks like this. So in the case of a batch annealing of low carbon steels, we have precipitation curve for aluminum nitride, and we have a recrystallization curve for uh, the steel, yes? And you can see uh, that um, uh, depending on the heating rate, the heating rate, yes, uh, I can have different situations. For instance, if I heat up in this way, I will start the recrystallization and then have later on have the precipitation of aluminum nitride. If I make this slightly longer here to, to make the point clear. If I uh, heat at this heating rate, I will start recrystallizing, I will start precipitating the aluminum nitride before the recrystallization. And if I go this way, I can see that both recrystallization and aluminum nitride precipitation will occur at the same time. And there will be the opportunity for the aluminum nitride to have an impact on the recrystallization. And in particular, what happens is the selection of the texture variants that become prominent. And so that's why the optimal heating rate has to be chosen. And it turns out that this optimal heating rate is a slow heating rate. Yes? A slow heating rate that is very much the heating rate that you have in batch annealing. So in batch annealing, yes, this slow heating rate is not necessarily a negative point. As a matter of fact, it allows you to make very formable steels, yes, because this slow heating rate is optimal heating rate to get the good texture hmm, related to formability. <laughs> of course, yes, in order to have aluminum nitride in precipitating during batch annealing, you must have aluminum nitride in solution, yes? 
And how is this achieved? Well, so the aluminum nitride must be in solution. Yeah. And how is this achieved? Well, you do this by controlling the coiling temperature in the hot strip mill. Yeah. And okay, so this is shown here. Um, this is the coiling temperature, yes. And we've changed the coiling temperature here from a very high coiling temperature to a low coiling temperature, 600. Yeah? Um, yeah? So what you see is in the cold rolled and annealed material, yes, you measure the R value. When the R value is high, it means you have the right texture because of this effect. Um, the um, uh, influence of the aluminum nitride precipitation on the recrystallization and the texture formation. And you see, if I coil at low temperatures, 600 degrees and lower, I ha achieve a high R value. If I coil at a high temperature, 700, etc., and higher, excuse me, I get a much lower R value. Reason is, when I coil at a low temperature, so coiling temperature below 600, I get, I get aluminum nitride stays in solution. Yes. If I coil above uh, 650, aluminum nitride precipitates in the coil, in the coiled strip, hmm? right? So, and that means you don't get R values that are, so this means R value will be high, this means R value will be low, hmm? okay? And you can also see that um, because the, uh, you have an impact of the uh, precipitation of aluminum nitride on the selection of uh, the texture components, grains with certain texture components that will grow, um, that will be favored during the grow. You can see that um, in this uh, picture here, when you have a high R value, you get these typically, these pancaked grains Whereas if you had used a high coiling temperature, your grains are very equiaxed, yes? And, um, and the texture is much more random, mm -hmm. all right? Okay, so very important. Um, the um, uh, rate of heating and cooling uh, is, however, an issue, hmm? the slow rates of heating and cooling are an issue in, um, in many cases. Hmm? Uh, why? Well, because um, a, a company doesn't always make high formability strip. Yes? Some uh, don't. They don't need these very high, high R values. So, uh, and then uh, having these uh, slow heating rates and slow cooling rates has an impact on productivity. Hmm? Okay, so um, that's why some um, uh, batch annealing uh, lines do not use or will use instead of HNX, so that's a mixture of hydrogen and nitrogen in the atmosphere of the furnace, they will use pure hydrogen. Yes, and pure hydrogen because it's a much better heat conductor, yes, will uh, reduce the process duration and will also have an impact on this, the cleanliness of the surface. So if you compare here an HNX uh, uh, thermal cycle, you can see here the te surface temperature and the core temperature takes about 80 hours uh, in this particular example. Mm -hmm. If you replace this with hydrogen, a little bit over uh, half that amount of time. So it goes much faster. Yeah? So 
productivity is improved. Then if you look at the removal of carbon, carbon residues from the surface, you see that you have about five or more milligrams of carbon uh, residues per square meter after H and X, and that's reduced to about one milligrams per meter uh, if you use pure hydrogen. So there are advantages to using hydrogen. The alternative to using uh, batch annealing is um, continuous annealing. And what could be the reason uh, for the uh, use of um, continuous annealing furnaces rather than batch annealing uh, uh, furnaces? Well, you can see it here. You see, there is a very large range of heating rates yes, between the surface of your sheet and the core and, and, and the sheet at the core of the coil. Yes, you can see here, right, very big. And, and so what does this mean? It means it's very hard to engineer the microstructure of the, with batch annealing, right? It's very hard. So, but it's not a problem with a continuous annealing furnace. With the continuous annealing furnace, you have the possibility to engineer the microstructure and the properties in a much more flexible manner, yes? And the reason is because you unroll the strip, yes? And you apply exactly the same um, process to, uh, thermal cycle rather, to every part of the strip. So in the, uh, and so as a consequence, you don't have inhomogeneity in the length of the strip in terms of properties, and, and you can engineer the microstructure. You can, uh, you can do, uh, generate a lot more microstructures than in the case of a uh, batch annealing furnace. So what you have, you have uh, uh, the furnace. This is, you can see here, this is the, the, the continuous annealing furnace seen from the, the outside. You can, the, the, so the strip is basically unwound at the entrance. It's welded to the, the end of the previous strip. And so there is a continuous flow of the material through the furnace. The temperatures does, don't change, yes? And so you can apply this, exactly the same thermal cycle to uh, um, the entire strip from the start to the end, yeah? Okay, and, and a typical uh, continuous annealing thermal cycle will look like this. There are many different thermal cycles, yes? It's possible that if you work in a, um, uh, a company that this thermal cycle will not apply, yes? We'll talk about this in a moment. But this is a typical continuous annealing thermal cycle, um, which originally designed by, by Nippon Steel for the production of um, uh, low carbon formable steels, for instance, for automotive panels, yeah? So what you do is you, you, you reheat to much higher temperatures. You can already see here over 800, yes, at a much faster rate. Then you cool down, slow cooling, then a fast cooling. Then there is a, a plateau. You can keep the temperature flat here. We'll see in a moment why we would do this. And then you cool down. Right, so this particular unit here is a continuous annealing process line. Uh, often referred to as CAPL, couple line, couple line in the industry. It has radiant tube furnaces. So again, you don't expose the strip surface to f uh, flame, burner flames, but to radiant tubes. So that means that you have tubes. In the tubes, there are burners, yes, that heats up these tubes, yes, and it's the radiant heat from these tubes that will heat up the, the strip and the gas atmosphere. Um, the height of the strip here, you had the, the strip moves up and down, yes? And so the height of the strip is typically about 20 meters. And the furnace is, of course, filled with a 
protective gas, so it doesn't oxidize, and it's filled with nitrogen and about 5% of hydrogen. Okay? So you have an entry uh, section you, consisting of decoilers, shear, welding, and then decreasing. Decreasing involves removing of iron fines and carbon, and that's being done by alkaline degreasing. Alkaline uh, solutions will remove uh, uh, the uh, lubricants, uh, leftovers, and you will also have electrolytic degreasing, which allows you to remove small particles from the surface. And there's also, there can also be brushing involved in the process of degreasing. Right? And then you, you, you go through an accumulator. There are accumulators in these lines at the front and in the back. The reason why we accumulate some strip in the line is to make sure that the line speed, the speed of the strip inside the process unit is constant. Yes? And that's essential because if you want to have every point of the a strip go through the same thermal cycle, you need to have constant strip speed. Hmm? So that's why you have these accumulators. Um, right, so, so how does this look like? You have a heating section, a soaking section, a first uh, cooling, an overaging, hmm? typically as we just saw um, in the, the thermal cycle in the previous slide, and then you have a second cooling. Hmm? Typical Temperatures here can be varied, and the temperatures here can also be varied. So you have flexibility in these lines, yes? And the soaking is typically 700 to 850, and, and this overaging typically 350 to 450, okay? So again, very important uh, difference here. When we do, this is, this is on uh, uh, the... Um, so this here on top is an iron carbon um, phase diagram, the iron rich side, yes? So uh, this here is the thermal cycle for a batch annealing furnace, where you have heating rates are 0.01 degrees per second, yes? And cooling rates are even slower, yes? You anneal up to maximum 700 degrees C and a typical process duration will be two days. Yes, and when you heat and you cool, yes, the carbon content of the steel, of the ferrite, will follow exactly the equilibrium carbon content line. Yes, because we, you heat up and you cool down so slowly. Yes, yes. So you end up with very low carbon in solid solution after the batch annealing. Yes. In the case of the continuous annealing, right, look at the scale here. This is 72 hours. This is 500 and, uh, yeah, so um, 400 and something minutes. This is, excuse me, seconds. So we, we're talking about an overall process duration that's less than 10 minutes, yes? Okay? Um, so the heating rates are less than 10 degrees per second. The cooling rates between 10 and 100 degrees per second at most. The annealing temperatures are 700 or higher, 700 to 850. And the constant and the process duration up to 500 seconds maximum. So less all less than 10 minutes, it's all finished, right? In comparison to two days. Yeah? So as a consequence, we don't achieve equilibrium carbon distribution. In fact, um, our, when we do the cooling here, yes, uh, our um, ferrite is uh, oversaturated in carbon, hmm? too much carbon. And that is the reason why we have this plateau here in the thermal uh, cycle. Hmm? Because let's see what happens during the thermal cycle when we uh, uh, process strip. So first, um, the strip is uh, cold work, so you first get recovery, 
at around 400, 450 degrees C. At 600, the recrystallization will be starting, yes? And by the time we reach 800 degrees C, we get grain growth and texture development, yes? Okay, then we decrease the, the temperature. So what we get there is a supersaturation of carbon in ferrite, yes? And so we need to make sure that this carbon precipitates out as cementite, okay? And so this is done in this, what we call over-aging stage. At the beginning, cementite nucleates, and it slowly grows, and so I get a decrease of the carbon content in solution as I go through the over-aging section, and then you, find, you do the final cooling. Now, some lines, yes, again, some lines process mostly interstitial-free steel grades. These steel grades are all, all go through a process of vacuum degassing, yes? These steels are also alloyed with small amounts of titanium, yes? In other words, in these steels, because I only have 20 ppm of carbon, and because I add 3 to 400 ppm, well, depending, 2 to 400 ppm of titanium, yes, I form titanium carbide. There's no need to do overaging, right? So lines that process mainly so-called titanium stabilized IF steels, these lines will not need these very large, these very long overaging stages. There you can just do recovery, recrystallization, grain growth and uh, 111 fiber texture development and then just cool down. Yes, in this case, the process is finished in 250 seconds. So you, you're basically talking about less than five minutes. You've processed the strip. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, but you can also do other things with um, a continuous annealing line. If you, if, if you have the appropriate uh, cooling sections or reheating sections. An example, for instance, is you can make very, very hard martensitic grades. Yes. How would you do this? Well, the strip uh, goes into a furnace. The furnace is now at relatively high temperatures. Yes. Uh, 980. Yes. At this temperature, we can form we can transform the steel. So in this case, we're not uh, interested in texture development, we're interested in microstructural uh, development. So we make fully austenitic annealing at 850, for instance, here, and then we cool. We cool, for instance, first slowly with a water jet, and then very quickly with fast cooling, yes? Giving, this gives you a water quench. Uh, the fast cooling, the water quench gives you a fast cooling. Yes? And so here you cool below the MS temperature. Yes? And as a consequence, you form, you go from gamma to martensite. After that, you can give a small reheating to the strip so that you temper the strip. So that's a reheating at 200 degrees C again for one or two minutes. And here, in less than 10 minutes, you have processed your strip, yes, and you have now a homogeneous uh, lath martensite, very hard uh, steel strip, yes. And it's very homogeneous. The properties are very, uh, are independent from the position in the strip, yes, and the strengths are very high. You can play around with this kind of uh, concept and one of the things you can do is instead of fully 
austenitizing the strip, you can intercritically anneal the strip. And when you intercritically anneal the strip, I just want to, to remind you what intercritical means. So if I look at the uh, iron carbon phase diagram, okay, so this is the this is the gamma region, this is alpha plus cementite, this is alpha region. If I do an annealing in this temperature range, for instance, I have this much carbon steel, I go to this temperature, I will form two phases. I will have ferrite phase and austenite phase. So, so my microstructure will look, will have ferrite and austenite. Okay. Okay, so that's this intercritical annealing. Yes, for instance at 860, yes. My microstructure will for instance that it depends on the carbon content here, but say will contain about 25% of it will be um, uh, austenite. When I do the cooling here, I can do the cooling such that this austenite transforms to martensite. Yes? So this phase is now changed to martensite. And I form now at room temperature a steel that contains a ferrite matrix and small particles, small grains of martensite dispersed throughout the microstructure. In other words, I have produced what is called a dual phase steel. Yes? Dual phase steels are very formable, very high strength steels. Yeah. And they are multi phase and two phase. Yeah. All right. So, big advantages in the use of continuous annealing, and that's the future um, for annealing because not only do we get homogeneous properties, but we can get a huge variety in steel microstructures and, and, and properties as a consequence. Okay, now when you have um, recrystallized, done the recrystallization annealing, yes, um, you will do something that uh, uh, at first will look very silly. You will do a deformation you will deform it, yeah. And this deformation is called the skin pass or the temper rolling, yes? And um, so, so, so you do the tandem mill, you do the annealing or the hot dip galvanizing, we'll talk about this in a moment, yes? And then the first thing you do is you, um, you do the skin pass mill, yes? And why do you do this? Well, it's you do this for three reasons. You may have to remove a yield point because there's still some carbon in solid solution. So you may need to. You will also use it to apply a surface texture. Now this is not crystallographic texture. It relates to the waviness of the surface and the roughness of the surface. Yes. And you may also have to improve the flatness of the sheet. Yes. That's the reason why you apply, um, the three reasons why we apply a skin pass. Hmm? Um, it's a very small reduction. Hmm? So it's not like 10%, it's about 1% to 2% at, at most. Yeah? And it's a, a special mill because you have a very long contact length between the roll and the sheet. Um, so you have a very large uh, work roll, yes? And it's usually uh, done in uh, dry uh, rolling, uh, dry friction conditions. And the deformation uh, is not homogeneous because we have these very low amounts of deformation. The uh, deformation is not homogeneous. I will, I will come back to that in a moment. Yeah? Yes, and it's a small reduction, so the amount of elastic strain 
the, the amount of plastic deformation you give is almost the same as the amount of elastic deformation you get to the strips. It's, it's, it's a very, very uh, uh, small amount of deformation, right? Okay? So usually it looks like this. Um, you can have standalone skin pass males where you bring in uh, the, um, the strip and you uncoil it and then you uh, pass it through the strip mill and then you, you coil it again. That's a single stand mill. In what, can, in what situations would you have this kind of skin pass mill? Well, if the material has been batch annealed because in batch annealing you cannot do inline skin pass. Hmm? In the case of um, uh, continuous annealing, you can have the skin pass in line. Hmm? Okay, so this is one of the things that the skin pass mill does. Um, uh, if your steel, after annealing, gives you a uh, yield point elongation, yes, yes, you can remove it. So this is the material without skin pass, and this is after skin pass. Yes. So why would you re want to remove it? Because this, when, when, when you have this um, uh, looter's bands, yes, the deformation is localized. Your sheet, you, when you deform the material, it's not homogeneously forming, it's deforming locally. And that gives you surface defects. And in many applications, these surface defects are unacceptable. Like you cannot use uh, it f to make um, steel furniture. You cannot make it to make uh, steel cabinets. You cannot use it to make cars. Yes. So you really need to remove this. Hmm? Uh, the steel itself, the strength, it has no impact on the strength. You know, the steel is the strength. It's just a surface effect. It's, yeah, um, a quality. Uh, surface quality, a visual appearance effect, yes? Which, and, and these marks are called stretcher strings. So removing uh, them um, is... So what happens when you remove this um, uh, yield point, yes? You see that the yield point, the yield strength decreases, yes? So the effectiveness uh, of the skin pass mill is related to the decrease in the yield strength. Okay. Right. Okay. So this this would be a, a skin pass mill schematic. Um, so you unwind, you rewind. Here you have some strains, typical strains, uh, a few percent, as I said. Except for electrical steels. Electrical steels, we do give them relatively high uh, strains, uh, but that's because that will improve the magnetic properties, and these steels usually get thermally treated later on. So that's, that, there's a reason why we, we have this. Okay. Um, so, so what happens if you look at the yield strength as a function of strain, yes, you see that in steels that have a yield point elongation, there is a drop in the yield strength. Yes. And then an increase as the deformation will also give you work hardening. Yes. Hmm. So if you deform a lot, you'll get work hardening. Yes. And then, then, then it's, it's not good. So the amount of deformation you want to give is typically at the minimum point here. And the minimum is less than 2%, typically around 1% of elongation of um, skin pass reduction. Hmm. Yes. And this, for, this is for a number of, of grades. Yes. And this is, is some more data here, perhaps a bit more precise, but you get the, the same idea here. This is for an aluminum killed uh, uh, drawing quality steel, yes? So you see that um, the yield point decreases to a minimum value, yes? At around 0.7% uh, of uh, elongation or deformation and then as if I do too much deformation, it will increase. Hmm? Here is the behavior. Now, the question is now, do we always apply skin pass? Yes, we do, right? 
you always do it because it's not only important to get rid of the yield point, you also want to have a surface a roughness on your sheet and you also want to make sure that your sheet is nice and flat. Yes? So you always do it, even for steels that do not have yield points. Yes? Now, what steels don't have yield points? <clears throat> well, I already talked to you about steels that do not contain any carbon, or excuse me, not only no uh, free carbon, because the carbon, the very low carbon content is stabilized with titanium, the IF steels. So when you uh, skin pass roll an IF steel, you will not see a minimum, obviously, because there never was a, a yield point elongation. Yes? Okay? So there you only see work hardening. So the more you deform an IF steel, the higher the strength. Yeah. Dual phase steels do also don't have yield points either. So uh, they're stronger steels because of the presence of martensite. So when you um, uh, deform them in the uh, skin pass mail, they also only show work hardening. Hmm? So you really need to have steels which, are, which have yield points. Yeah? And, and those ones will be steels with um, um, low carbon steels where there is uh, carbon in solid solution. Hmm? Carbon or nitrogen in solid solution. Okay. Right. Right, and so this this is an example. So you can you can not only look at the yield strength, but you can also look at the yield point elongation itself. Okay, and the more you deform, the smaller the yield point elongation becomes. Yes, and you can see here um, the uh, effect. And usually, as I said, a few percent, less than uh, two percent um, of elongation is typically applied. Now, this deformation in the skin pass mill is not homogeneous, yes? So, um, uh, because the deformation, the amount of deformation you apply, yes, mm, um, only a part of the volume will actually go through, will actually plastically deform, yeah? So, the, the, the temporal strip, this is in this schematic, will contain gray regions which are not deformed and uh, black regions which are deformed, yes? And, and that is the reason why we get the, um, um, the yield point elongation and the yield point disappear because um, at many points in the strip, these black regions here, I can easily initiate yielding there is a higher dislocation density, yes? And, and, uh, and there is no pinning of the dislocations by carbon atoms, and so I get uh, initiation of deformation in these uh, distributed points, in these points that are distributed all across the sheet. All right. Okay, now, skin pass is also used to, um, for, uh, to apply a, a, what we call a surface texture or a surface roughness. Mm -hmm. So uh, why, why do we want a, a, a specific roughness on the strip? Mm -hmm. So, well, we want it because we can, by controlling the roughness on the strip, we can control the deep drawing behavior of the strip in a press. Yes? It controls the friction, it controls the distribution of the lubricant during forming, yes? it controls the, the transport of the lubricant to the deformation zones, that's one reason. And the other reason is because roughness on the surface of the strip also has a big impact of the appearance, the visual appearance of the part after painting, yes? So, in a, so for instance, when you do a, a press forming operation, you will have your sheet and it will have a certain roughness, okay? So here I just want, just so you know this roughness here, we're talking about 
microns, okay? Not, not millimeters, microns. So it's very, very uh, small roughness, right? Very, very small uh, topography, rather. Hmm? And, and this is the tool, hmm? for, for instance, your stamping tool, yes? And there is a lubricant applied when you do, yes? So the, the roughness here will have a big influence on the distribution of this lubricant and on the friction properties of the strip. Yeah? So conventional roughness, the lubricant distribution will, for instance, be very unhomogeneous, yes? Whereas if we control the roughness, we can control the distribution of the lubricant hmm? and have lubricant pockets distributed all over the sheet surface in a non-random way or in a controlled manner. Hmm? Okay? So, um, and, and the control of the, the roughness is done by texturing, applying a, a specific roughness on the work roll of the skin pass mill. So this is a picture of the work roll, not, not the strip, the work roll of a strip of a skin pass mill. And this is a controlled but random texture, yes, which has been uh, uh, obtained by electro discharge texturing. And this is a non-random texture obtained by electron beam texturing of the roll surface. So, so what, what you have here is a roll, the, the skin pass uh, work roll, yes, and these uh, so-called EDT or electro discharge texturing units that uh, generate this specific roughness on the uh, roll surface. This is an EBT texturing machine, electron beam texturing machine, where you see this is the roll here, yes? and the manner in which you make these little uh, craters on the roll surface is by an electron beam. Yes? Okay. So let's have a look at these, uh, how this, uh, what are the, the, the ways we make roughness on a roll. Yes? They're basically four methods, yes, uh, you can do shot blast texturing where you basically use special uh, shot uh, uh, and you blast it on the surface hmm, to have, get a specific uh, roughness and, the, and the, the roughness is created when a particle of this blast material hits the roll surface, yes, and makes an imprint, yes? In the case of laser texturing, we have a laser beam, a CO2 laser or another laser type of laser, yes? We chop this beam so it goes up on and off, on and off, yes? Mm -hmm. And we focus it on the surface of the roll. So where the laser beam hits, we form a little crater and the, the steel is ejected out of molten and ejected out of this crater and you get a solidified edge and, uh, and a little pit at the surface, yes? Laser texture. Electron beam texturing is similar except we have electrons that hit the surface of the roll. Again, you melt the steel surface, you eject some of the, ma the molten material away and you end up with a little crater on the surface. And you can do electro discharging where you actually have a dis an, um, electrical discharge and that will cause the, you will sputter away some of the material and create roughness this way. Hmm? Uh, the EDT roll texturing has become very popular, used quite widely because it's a, a simple and robust uh, texturing uh, method. So here you see uh, your uh, work roll. This is the, the, the texturing unit. It basically consists of um, uh, phosphor bronze electrodes, heads, that will face the coil. Yes. And then there is some dielectric fluid between these, these electrodes here and the roll. Hmm? 
So you make a, uh, you, you apply a field between these two, yes? They're little metallic particles in this um, uh, dielectric, so uh, the particles will align and form a bridge, yes? This bridge will cause a uh, spark, yes? Yes? Sparks, and you will also form bubbles, yes? You will form uh, liquid droplets here in the crater rim, and you will form a little bubble, yes? And then you end up with the surface with a little crater, yes? And the whole process can start over again, all right? Okay, so, so, um, so, so for instance, in uh, parts that, are, um, that are, have to undergo uh, important amount of deformation, uh, uh, the tribology or the friction behavior, press forming is very important, and you want to have a low friction coefficient. And, uh, and that is achieved with these specific surface roughnesses. And very often, uh, certainly in automotive industry, uh, these, these textures are, are discussed with the customer uh, so that they have high yield and high productivity in their forming presses. Yes. What's also important is that these panels here, uh, these uh, horizontal panels and vertical panels, that are visible, yes? There, the surface, the painted uh, surface appearance is very important. So you want to have things like a high peak count in your roughness. You want to have a homogeneous peak distribution. You want to have a low roughness, a controlled waviness in this, yes? So that you get an improved paint flow, an improved paint appearance, and also good paint adhesion uh, in the case of stone chipping hmm, on exterior panels, all right? Very important uh, quality issues. All right, so, so now we've come to the, the end of the uh, uh, cold strip mail and what comes with the cold strip mail. We already talked about the fact that a lot of the strip, uh, cold rolled strip is actually uh, coated, and so that means um, that we need to uh, introduce the subject of uh, coating technologies. Yes. One of the um, interesting things that um, uh, related to steel products is, and I'm sure you've heard this as you are uh, when you were getting um, undergraduate education in material science, is um, when, um, when, when you're presented, um, uh, and, uh, when there is talk about steels, one of the, um, uh, the big negatives of, that is mentioned is the fact that steel rusts. And, um, the interesting thing is that, uh, in practice, the rusting of steel is, is actually not an important engineering problem in many cases. Uh, be not because it doesn't occur, it's because we have engineering solutions to the issue, yes? Um, whether it's uh, for cars or for buildings or for um, oil rigs, yes, we know how to take care of it. So in, in a sense, it's a, it's a non-problem, yes. And one of the um, big successes of um, a, a steel sheet is the, is the fact that in the past, whereas in the past, um, uh, automotive vehicles would be sensitive, very sensitive to rusting, yes. Um, nowadays, um, when you uh, purchase a car, you can be sure that there will be, there will, the, the car will probably show only very minimal rust 20 years from now. Yes? Some companies actually guarantee, easily gu will guarantee you, uh, you know, more than 10 years without any rust. Yes? So um, 
the, um, the reason why that is is because uh, a lot of um, uh, parts, automotive parts, uh, are uh, provided with a, uh, a coating that will um, suppress this corrosion. And a, a key part to this, this coating is, is uh, the application of zinc by uh, galvanizing. The application of zinc by galvanizing is not the only reason why uh, we have no corrosion issues anymore. Uh, a paint system of, of a car will consist not only of uh, zinc, but also of a... Um, uh, the application of a phosphate layer, thin phosphate layer, and then a so-called electrophoretic primer hmm, and a top coats, one or two cop top coats. And it is this system, this coating system, which has been very efficient in suppressing um, uh, corrosion. Okay, so let's, let's um, talk a little bit about this. Mm -hmm. There are very many applications where um, steel is, is uh, coated, and not only automotive, um, the visual, what you see of automotive products, but also um, parts such as exhaust systems. Uh, consumer uh, products also are uh, coated, uh, and um, constructional steel products are also very often um, uh, coated. Mm -hmm. Now, what um, happens, we know what happens when it's not coated or the coating is inadequate, um, and in particular when there is no zinc coating, you get a very uh, special um, types of corrosion, such as filiform corrosion on cold rolled steel that is painted, or you can get, and this, this kind of corrosion here is called um, a, uh, a cosmetic corrosion. It's just visually very ugly to see, but uh, not dangerous. What's more dangerous are perforation corrosion situations where you basically lose the material, yes? And that can be, of course, very dangerous uh, if these are structural parts. Mm -hmm. And you see this in old cars. Uh, you, you can see this, this perforation corrosion uh, problem. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, usually we test for corrosion performance by uh, taking panels of uh, material, applying a, a coating system, and then uh, basically destroying the, the coating system. Uh, because if you don't do that, it's, it's, uh, you know, it takes forever to test. And then you apply a... Um, salt spray test and this is the example of the res an example of results that you get when you apply a salt spray test on a painted panel yes cold rolled steel on which you have applied an automotive paint system that consists of a phosphate layer an electrophoretic primer and a top coat yes a, ba a base coat and a top coat, yes? And you, what you see is that you get a lot of red rust, yes? And also paint under creep. The, the corrosion goes under the paint. If you use a hot galvanized panel instead, you see that there is very little red rust, hmm? except maybe in, in the scratch here. And then you, it's replaced by this white rust hmm? coming from the zinc corrosion products. And now if you use, instead of using a galvanized uh, material, pure zinc coated steel, you use an alloy layer. For instance, this particular case, a zinc iron alloy layer, yes? You see that the amount of corrosion is much less, yes? And that you also get excellent paint adhesion. Hmm? So, in the absence of zinc, yes, the, the, the iron will oxidize. And the problem is that these oxidation products 
are, have a very large specific volume. Yes? So they will cause the lifting, lifting off of any, um, any uh, uh, part of the steel that is protected or should be protected by uh, paint system. Hmm? This is shown here. So um, you get what's called cathodic uh, disbondment. Hmm? So first of all, the uh, reactions um, evolve uh, the cathodic reduction of dissolved oxygen. So oxygen and water, yes, hmm? are present everywhere in this system. Also, where you have paint, because paints are um, um, uh, oxygen and water can diffuse through paint layers, yes? Mm -hmm. So for instance, here you have oxygen and water reacting to form hydroxy um, anions at the surface, yes? picking up electrons. Mm -hmm. And these electrons come from the iron that goes into solution. And that's the anodic reaction that uh, can occur at a surface defect, for instance. Yeah? So you get uh, formation of these, uh, these oxides, and that will lift off the oxide. Mm -hmm. The cathodic reaction is always the same, yes? So you've, you basically reduce the uh, oxygen, yes? you form OH anions, yes? and, um, and, and usually the, uh, the type of oxides you form are oxyhydroxides, yes? like for instance here, iron OH2. Yes? And uh, this can then further uh, evolve into the formation of magnetite, or hematite at the surface in the scratches. And that's what basically gives you this red rust. In the case of um, uh, zinc, you see here you have, uh, this is a, a scratch, you have a, a scratch here. This is the zinc layer here, yes. This is a primer, and this is a filler or the, um, or a, uh, also, it's also the name of a, a paint layer here, yes? And, you s and, and there is a phosphate layer here, yes? You can see that the corrosion is entirely limited to the zinc, yes? And here you see the, the zinc corrosion products. Here you have the zinc layer. It's actually a zinc iron layer, yes? And that's where the corrosion front is. And you can even see it on this image here where you see the, the, the zinc layer is white. Yeah. And these are the, all these products are zinc corrosion products. Okay? So you, uh, the, the presence of the zinc makes it possible to have no, to suppress all the corrosion of uh, the iron, even if you have a badly scratched uh, paint layer, in, which include scratching the, uh, the galvanized layer. Hmm? To achieve this uh, level of protection, yes, uh, you need very little zinc. Yes? In fact, uh, there, there are two ways, by the way, w which we apply zinc is by electrocoating, electrogalvanizing, or by hot dip galvanizing. Hmm? So in, when you electrocoat uh, strip, you typically have 2.5 to 15 microns per side, yes? Or 20 to 105 grams per square meter. So, so we're talking about, again, micron thickness, yes? Electro coatings are usually applied on consumer uh, products, yes? And they tend to be on the lower end of this thickness scale. Hmm? Hot dip coatings are used in constructional applications, so constructional steels and automotive steels. Yeah? So in constructional steels, very often uh, we want long-term corrosion uh, resistance in, um, 
in situations where uh, there may not be a paint layer applied. Yes? So we need thicker coatness, coat, um, coating thicknesses, yeah? so 700 grams per square meter, which, which makes it about 50 micron per side, so that's thick. But in automotive steels, we always have a pretty complex uh, coating system. So um, we'll have uh, GI or galvanized coatings will go from 6 to 20 microns per side. And GA, that's galvanized or zinc iron coatings, they will go from 6 to 11 microns per side. So very thin layers indeed. Okay? So we'll continue this next tomorrow, excuse me, yes, I was going to say next week, but we'll do this tomorrow. And, um, and for those who haven't uh, received the email, tomorrow we have makeup, uh, two makeup classes.